going to preach tonight on the thought of a greater ministry. A greater ministry. I, I thought in preparation this past week as I was thinking about preaching on this very thought, I, I thought that such a title would probably really grab the attention, probably more so than the crowd here tonight, and it probably grabbed the attention more so of a more ecumenical crowd, a, a crowd that's built uh, or desirous of just building some larger ministry. We live in that day and age where folks are more interested in an empire than they are in the truth of the Word of God. They are more interested in uh, popping their galluses at the next fellowship meeting than they are in, uh, in the quality of the work that God is doing. And so there's a huge deviation from the Word of God. And that's not just taking place in Roman Catholicism. We expect them to believe what they do because they're outside of the common grace of God. But uh, even in the ranks of what we would call evangelicalism, and uh, in the mainstream denominations, to make it more personal, even in the fundamentalist crowd uh, tonight, there is a, a great departing from the faith in an attempt to just draw a crowd. It's denoted under the, under the, the, the terminology of pragmatism. Uh, that is just, uh, just a seeker-friendly wanting to enlarge and embolden ourselves, and so we look like there's a lot, of, a lot going on. I learned a long time ago that you can't tell how much gas is in the tank by how loud the horn honks. And so those things really don't, uh, don't matter to us. But, but what, a, what a title, just to, just to grab somebody's attention that just wants a bigger and better ministry, something more highlighted in the marquee, so to speak. But we would find tonight, I think, through the course of this message, that a more prominent ministry is not what Jesus has in mind. A... Uh, a a bigger, as far as numbers are concerned, is not necessarily what Jesus has in mind. I, I believe if I was to say at the outset of this thing, uh, the thrust of the passage, and Jesus is dealing with the disciples' effect upon this world. The particular statement by Christ here inside of verse number 12 is probably one of the more puzzling truths that Jesus ever conveyed to us His church he begins by informing us that those who believe on Him were going to accomplish the same works that He performed. So do not get it confused this evening. Jesus is not talking about us participating in any other ministry other than the ministry that He participated in. And that is a singular ministry tonight, the ministry of the gospel of the grace of God. It's denoted as the gospel of the kingdom. That's not a different gospel message. That, that is the same gospel message that we preach. The entrance into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God eventually will be an earthly, physical, tangible kingdom established upon this world. We're sure of that tonight. Uh, but presently speaking, the kingdom of God is a spiritual, unseen kingdom. A kingdom, Jesus says, that men are pressing into. Pressing into by by a conscious realization of their sin, a turning from their sin. That's not a works-based salvation. That is Bible repentance. And turning from your sin. The writer of Hebrews says that there are things that accompany salvation. Things that accompany salvation is a departing from sin and an apprehension of the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul said it like this, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have repentance minus faith, you do not have salvation. If you have faith minus repentance, you do not have salvation. You can have repentance without faith or faith without repentance. And if you come up short in either, in either spectrum, you will not be saved. Brother Mitchell said repentance turns you out, faith turns you in. It's, uh, it's the two signs of a battery, negative and positive. We must repent if we are to place our faith. Repentance is you turning against yourself and turning to God. It's you understanding that you'll never be good enough in and of yourself. And so you turn on yourself, which is the hardest thing a man ever did do. Jack Howes said it was easy to be saved. Jack Howes didn't know a lot about his Bible, evidently. The hardest thing a man ever did was turn on himself. I didn't get enough amens right there. It's not an easy thing to be saved. The hardest thing a man ever did is turn on himself. The Bible says most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. And so that's the conviction and the, and the time of God working in us. That's why God has to grant repentance to an individual because you wouldn't turn against yourself. I don't even turn against myself in a good fight with my wife. <laughs> Amen. It's a very troubling, puzzling statement that Christ conveys to us even in the outset of it that we are going to perform the same works that He did, a gospel kingdom 
work. In gospel ministry, Jesus says, verse number 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he, shall he do also. We're about, let me just say tonight, we're about doing what Jesus did. Uh, some years ago, it became popular to wear the bracelets, WWJD, what, uh, what would, or WWJD, what would Jesus do? I, I, never, I never jumped on that bandwagon. I, I think a better question to ask is, what did Jesus do? I'm not interested in the hypotheticals tonight. I'm interested in what thus saith the Lord and looking into the Word of God. How did Jesus conduct His life? What was Jesus about? And as His believers, John 14, 12 says that we are to carry on this same work. And it's in the emphatic sense. The works that Jesus did, Jesus says His disciples shall do also. We're about the work of Christ tonight. So Jesus begins by informing us, those that believe, that we are going to accomplish the same works that Jesus performed. Now, I would, I would ask permission tonight to be able to say here that any assumption to this very concept apart from the mouth of Jesus would have to be considered preposterous. For us to say in mortal tongue tonight without any divine aspiration upon it that we are going to do the same works that Jesus did would have to be preposterous at best this evening if these words did not come from Christ Himself. Stop and think about it at this point, John 14. All that Jesus had done here, calming the storm, walking on the water, healing blinded eyes, people that were born blind, uh, casting demons out from, from, from dumb and, and mute uh, deaf and, and mute people, uh, raising individuals from the dead, even Lazarus, who had been dead four days and stunk, present tense. And Jesus had raised him from the dead. And Jesus says, verse number 12, the works that I do shall he do also. <laughs> Would any of us tonight be so presumptuous as to ever think that we could ever fill in to the shoes of Jesus. But then, in verse number 12, Jesus raises the bar for us and says that we are not only going to do the works that He has done, but He goes on to say that we will do greater works than what He has done. Greater works, Jesus says, verse number 12, than these. Than what? Than what I have accomplished, Jesus says. Those that believe on me shall do greater works than these. I wonder tonight what these 11 disciples thought initially when they heard these words. Can you imagine being in the upper room? At this point, you've served alongside of Christ for three years. You've seen uh, things that you can't even yet explain. You can't even wrap your heads around. Three of these men, Peter, James, and John, saw the transfiguration of Christ. They saw Moses and Elijah. Now they, they have seen almost irrepeatable things throughout these last three years. And now Jesus says, you're going to do the same things, and you're going to go on to do greater works than these. Well, what would have the initial response of these now remaining 11 disciples had been? I wonder, did they puff their chest out and think, oh yeah, that's right, I'm going to do more than Jesus. Or I wonder tonight, did they think, maybe they shrunk back in humility and thought to themselves, there's no way I'll ever measure up. What was their initial reaction? Fortunately for us tonight, we have 2,000 years of church history to help us properly understand what Jesus was saying. Looking at the lives and ministries of the apostles through the book of Acts, we learned that they did some pretty incredible things, did they not? <clears throat> In fact, I believe we could say tonight that this was the greatest generation of church history. Thank God for the men that we read about from the 1400s and 15, 16, 17, even 1800s, even men, 1900s, men like, um, men like G. Campbell Morgan, uh, men like uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, men like uh, Ian Paisley and the likes of those individuals that blazed a trail 
A lot could be said about those men, but I'd be convinced tonight that the greatest generation that the church has ever seen was, was what we see in the book of Acts. A, uh, a group of men that were banded together and, and rejoiced. We saw this morning in Sunday school. They rejoiced, Acts chapter number 5, that they were counted worthy to suffer for His name's sake. It's incredible what they were called to do and how they did it with a smile on their face. But I would also say tonight that we could not honestly say that the apostles did greater works than Jesus in regard to His power. The disciples, the immediate disciples, were not more powerful than Jesus. And it is also highly doubtful that they performed more miracles than Jesus did. I would contest tonight even probably the combined efforts of those early church disciples probably did not, as far as quantity was concerned, accomplish, perform more miracles than what Christ performed. So they were not more powerful. They were not more miraculous, if you will. So what exactly did Jesus mean by the expression greater works? Greater works. The word translated greater is mizion. Mizion. M-E-I-Z-O-N. The word simply means larger. It's not a real complex word. And Jesus says that those that believe on Him, the works that, that He did and that shall He do also, and larger works, greater works. Uh, the word itself for greater is used both literally and figuratively inside of the Scriptures. Figuratively, it carries the idea of being better than something. Being better. But literally, it refers to a larger capacity. A larger capacity. Here are some examples in the Scriptures of it being used literally. Romans chapter 9 and verse number 12 in regards to Jacob and Esau. The Bible says the elder... Mizion, the greater, the larger, the elder shall serve the younger. Larger in capacity of years. The elder, Esau, is going to serve the younger, Jacob. It's also used, James chapter 4, verse number 6, but he giveth more, greater, larger, Mizion, he giveth more grace. More in the sense of capacity. There's a, an abundant supply. Aren't you glad about that tonight? There's an abundant supply of grace. I was thinking a moment ago, and I don't do this much, and I'm not trying to reduce the service down to sentimentalism or emotionalism, but Ms. Maxine, I was thinking a moment ago with Brother John and Brother William up singing in the choir, a wonderful testament to the grace of God, what God is capable of doing in a, in a, in a family's life. It's wonderful to see that God gives more grace. When you got saved, that wasn't... A, and what you didn't empty the reserve of God's grace. There's abundant grace. There's, a, there's sufficient grace. He giveth more grace, James said. More, a larger capacity. What are you going through tonight? There's a vast supply, an endless supply of God's grace. Interpreting the word literally probably fits better with the overall theme of the context of John chapter 14. And since the apostles did not do more powerful works, or if I say it this way, the disciples did not do better works than Jesus. They did not do better works than Jesus. It makes sense then that Jesus was referring then to the extent of their ministries and not the wow effect of their ministries. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't talking about uh, a light show, some spectacular... He wasn't, he wasn't talking about uh, what goes on at the hydrant or the bridge. He wasn't talking about a fanfare show. He was, um, he was referencing the extent of their ministries. In other words, Jesus was speaking of the capacity of their works. A larger ministry. Again, not just numerically. We'll see how that plays together here in just a minute. But, but it wasn't just a highlighted feature of numbers. It was the capacity, the extent of their works. Now, think with me just for a moment to see if uh, this will make sense for us tonight. And Jesus Himself in His earthly ministry never preached outside of Palestine according to the Scriptures. His outreach to a Gentile community was only limited 
to just reaching a few isolated Gentile individuals. So he never preached outside of Palestine. And in reaching a Gentile community, he was limited to only reaching a few of those individuals. But Jesus' followers, the same disciples in the upper room in John chapter number 14, would spread the gospel throughout the world. His disciples, particularly Peter and Paul, would reach the Gentile world with the gospel. In fact, Peter would unlock the door of the gospel to the Gentile world in Acts chapter number 10 with the house of Cornelius. Paul would pick up the baton and would be sent out on his first missionary journey with, uh, with Barnabas. And uh, he would travel some 1,700 miles in that first missionary journey, establishing churches, seeing uh, multitudes come and trust Christ as their Savior. And the majority of those individuals would be Gentile converts. The number of believers in Christ would grow from the hundreds to the time we reach the book of Revelation at the conclusion of the church age to an innumerable host represented in heaven. And the fulfillment of exactly what God had said to Abraham that if you can number the stars of heaven is fulfilled. The question that I would like for us to address tonight in regards to such a greater ministry, greater in terms of the extent, the reach of ministry would be this. What would be the contributing factor to make these greater works a reality for these disciples? What is it that would be the causative effect in their life that would have these disciples accomplish greater works than Jesus. Listen to what he says in verse 14, uh, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Why were these disciples going to be able to perform greater works than Jesus? Jesus says, I'll tell you. It's because I go to my Father. Now what does that expression mean? What does it mean that Jesus is going to go to His Father? Well, in John 14, we are in the upper room in the Last Supper scene. <clears throat> Jesus has already dismissed Judas. He is now presently giving last instructions to His genuine disciples before He dies hours from now. The theme of this whole night's discourse is a singular theme. Here it is. Jesus is conveying to them in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, and even into 18. And Jesus is conveying this one central thought, I am about to die. I am about to die. And Jesus says, my mission is almost complete. My purpose for coming into this world is almost here. He was about to give his life on a cross. He would not die from a lack of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed and sweat through his capillaries bursting from the tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous amount of anguish. That was exerted, the burden of sin that would be placed upon him as he peered into the cup that the Father had prepared for him. And as he shrank back thinking that he would have to drink all of it. Not one ounce left behind. Separation from his Father. Something that the, that the fellowship of the Trinitarian Godhead had never experienced and would never experience thereafter. He would drink every bit of that cup. And Jesus is saying to His disciples, this is the reason why I came. And my purpose is almost fulfilled. So He was about to give His life on the cross. And in dying, He was going to return to His Father. 
His statement in verse number 12 contemplates in a prior sense that he is going to die, that he is going to be buried, that he is going to rise again just as he said, and he is going to ascend back to his Father. It's a precursor to the reality that his sacrifice would be, uh, would be uh, sufficient. It would be successful. His death was about to be a reality. And so Jesus says to these disciples, because of what is about to take place at the cross, those that believe me are going to continue the ministry that I have begun. And we're here tonight 2,000 years later thankful thankful that those that believe on Christ because He died, because He rose again, because He ascended to His Father, we are here because men and women just like us have believed that message and have carried on that same work now for 2,000 years. How's that for prophecy? And their reach is going to go far beyond the number of Jesus' earthly ministry. And that's what it means to do greater works. And Jesus says, I am sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he's saying here in John 14, verse number 12, you're going to go further than that. You're going to be sent to more people than that. The cross then is not only God's means of reconciling the world to Himself, it is also His motivation for saints to take the message of salvation into that same world. When you look at the cross, you're looking at the only motivation that you and I should need to preach the Gospel to every creature. It's that cross that's highlighted behind me tonight is the, <coughs> is the imprint of that cross that should motivate you this Saturday morning to get out of your bed and to show up to soul winning visitation and to take some gospel tracts in your hand and to knock on doors and to tell somebody, let me tell you about the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's that cross that's behind me that ought to motivate us tonight uh, to go home to our families uh, and to go to our prospective jobs uh, and your schools uh, and your place of business tomorrow and take the gospel message uh, and proclaim it aloud to the individuals that we come into contact with. The cross is God's motivation for His saints to take the message of salvation into that same world. Let me give to you just a few thoughts and we'll be done tonight. Number one, the cross demands our evangelism. The cross demands our evangelism. If you consider yourself to be a believer, and yet you are lax towards evangelism, tonight I'd like to say one thing to you. Look at the cross. If you consider yourself tonight to be a genuine believer, and yet you are apathetic towards the salvation of your family members, Have you even thought about what the cross represents? Listen to the words of the Savior. Because I have done all that I have came to do, Jesus says. You'll do greater works. And put yourself into the shoes of those disciples. Because we're removed 2,000 years, but the message is just as relevant for us today. Jesus is saying, because I have gone to my Father, you as believers, not, not, not pastors of local churches, not deacons in a local church, not, 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 not serving on some missionary board somewhere, but because you believe in me. Do you get that verse number 12? That's the, that's the precursor. That's the prerequisite. He that believeth on me. The question tonight is, do you believe? The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, made this statement. He said, have you no desire for souls to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Let's look to the cross. The cross demands our evangelism. And Jesus says, you would take my work and do it in a greater capacity. Number two, 
The cross determines our sacrifice. The cross determines our sacrifice. For those of us who would be tempted to say, I'm too tired, I'm too busy, I've got too much going on, again, I would say to us tonight, look to the cross. (laughs) Tell your bleeding Savior, as it were, as He hangs between earth and heaven, that you do not have time and you will not be bothered by taking His message to a lost and dying world that He died for. Amen. 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 We're so concerned with ourself and our, our own image. Everything. Th- think about how much time we spend catering to ourselves. <laughs> and somebody said, uh, our danger is becoming too heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. That's not the danger of the church in 2020. We're so earthly minded, we care for ourselves. We, we, care, we care more about our own pleasures. Our, our self-indulgence is eating us up alive and, and, and we could care less. And some of us tonight ought to hit the altar and stay there until God gives a tear in our eyes. We speak to our family members. We know they're lost and yet the name Jesus Christ never comes out of our mouth. We go to work and we work alongside of individuals that have never heard a true presentation of the gospel and yet we talk about everything else under the sun save the gospel number three tonight the cross defines our compassion the cross defines our compassion listen to the words of Paul Paul said in Galatians 2.20 that Christ loved me and gave himself for me Um, somebody asked I guess kind of a larger question. I guess you would consider it a theological question. Why did Jesus die for us? Uh, Similar question is why does God love us? Uh, Let me me try to clear that up for us tonight. It's not because we're so good. It's not because God saw something in you that was just so compelling Him. Uh, We dealt with it this morning, didn't we? Ephesians chapter 1, according to the good pleasure of His own will. He chose to love us. He chose to love us. You chose to love your wife. You chose to love... We're we're so drunk, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but we're so drunk on, on, on Hollywood's version of love. It's just based on emotionalism. You can fall in love with anybody if you've got an orchestra falling here. In Photoshop, <laughs> right? That's, uh, that's not love. That's, that's, that's love. Uh, in, in Greek, that would be eros, sensual, very base, very shallow. It's not lasting. It's not effectual. Um, I didn't want to marry somebody ugly. I get that? So I chose to love somebody pretty. Right? Right. She got her a hunk, too. <laughs> My son's in the sound booth. <laughs> Paul said, Christ loved me. Therefore, he gave himself for me. Paul understood that Christ died for him because Christ loved him. This was the motivation. He says, Christ performed the ministry. Do you get that? He performed the ministry. He died for me. This commandment, Jesus said, have I received of my Father. I I must go to Jerusalem, Jesus says. I must suffer many things of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I must die, Jesus says. I, I, I did not come, Jesus said, to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life as a ransom for all. His ministry was motivated because he loved us. Paul understood that he was to love those very same people then to whom Christ loved and offered his life. Take your Bibles real quick and and we'll be done tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. (coughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Watch the words of Paul here. 
Remember the cross defines our compassion. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one, Christ, died for all the world, then we're all dead. You see the line of reasoning here? One, Christ, died for all, right? You'd have to go to a commentary to get another meaning of that word in, in this context, right? He died for all, and therefore, he says, all were what? Dead. We're all in the same boat. So stop trying to figure out who's elect and who's not. Right? Stop trying to figure out the ones that are easy to witness to and that you think might respond. You'd be surprised at the ones that would if you'd give them the gospel. Right? So he says, the love of Christ constraineth us. It compels us. It's our motivation. Paul says, Paul says it's the fact that Christ loved us. Who do you love? Well, Paul says, I'm just figuring here since he died for everyone, because everyone was dead, I'm guessing he loves all of us. Right? Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth do what? Live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There, there comes, verse number 15, those of us that have come already to that realization that Christ died for us, and you will not come to that realization apart from the Spirit of God illuminating your mind. And when we come to grips with that fact, when we have seen ourselves lost and undone, helpless without God, and we look to the cross, and it's no longer that God loved the world, and it's no longer that Christ loved the church, but that He loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul says, for those of us that realize that, we have come to this realization that we henceforth do not live for ourselves. Amen. This is characteristic of the children of God that we do not live for ourselves. We're dead men walking. He said a little bit differently. Remember that to the church in Rome, Romans 12? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice. Paul said to the church at Corinth, you are not your own. What's the, what's the precursor to that? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, because of this truth, Paul says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong, which are God's. They belong to God. We henceforth should not live unto ourselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Here's my question tonight. Who are you living for? Tonight it's real easy to get cold and complacent and apathetic even. We live in a messed up world, a messed up society. It won't take you 30 seconds of getting back out in the world's filth to start reverting back to her ways if you're not careful. What do we do, preacher? Let me tell you what we do. 